And now I would like to welcome to the virtual stage, your MC for this presentation, Professor Jeff Froshman. Well, hello, vast viewing audience, and welcome to the 20th Annual Ethics and Responsible Business Forum. I'm your MC and moderator, Professor Jeff Froshman. This annual event is sponsored by a number of organizations of which we can thank the College of Business, the College of Arts, Humanities and Social Services, the College of Health Sciences and Human Services, the College of Science and supported by associated students. Our topic, woke capitalism. Should businesses jump in or stay out? That is the question. In this culturally divided environment, businesses are caught in a dilemma. How can businesses act responsibly given our current political context? Should they embrace corporate activism or remain neutral? At this year's live webinar event, our keynote speakers will debate whether and to the extent which businesses should influence the moral and political lives of citizens. Our panelists will probe how different types of corporate involvement in the moral and political sphere can positively or negatively impact society. With that, it is now my pleasure to welcome to the camera our Dean of the College of Business, Dr. Mary Lou Shockley. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, uh, I'm so excited to welcome all of you to the 20th, get it, 20th annual Ethics and Responsible Business Forum. And let me start also as Jeff Froshman did by recognizing our deans. And also I wanna make a, a shout out to our associated students who also provide support for this, this event every year. So again, my dean colleagues include Dean Andrew Lawson. And again, Andrew is from the College of Science and uh, Dean Juanita Cole, College of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences. And of course, last but not least, Dean Harold Barkoff from the College of Health Sciences and Human Services. So again, thank you so much for supporting this signature event at CSUMB. I also want to take a moment to honor a dear friend and colleague, our MC, Jeff Froshman, who is our distinguished lecturer at the College of Business. Believe it or not, Jeff has been the MC for this event for 18 out of the 20 years we've held the forum. And I'm just so grateful to count him as a friend and also to have him on the team of the College of Business. So thank you so much, Jeff, for everything you do for the College of Business. This forum was especially designed for the 20th anniversary. As you know, leadership in business is becoming far more complex. Case in point, multinational companies have had to withdraw from Russia, like McDonald's, Microsoft, and Visa. They've had to close down their operations in Russia due to the war with Ukraine. That has hit their bottom line extremely hard. So not only do leaders need to focus on profits, but they have to focus on other elements of responsible business like people, the planet, equity, and ethics. So today's debate should be fun, listen hard, also think about what's being said today in our discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll turn it back to Jeff Rosham. Thank you, Jeff. Well, thank you very much, Mary Lou. And now let us hear remarks from our CSUMB president, Dr. Eduardo Ochoa. Hello, I'm President Eduardo Ochoa. Welcome to the 2022 Ethics and Responsible Business Forum. There is an increasing desire among consumers, particularly millennials, for corporations and their brands to be clear about their values. While some businesses openly support social causes, take a political stance, or perform brand activism, others are unwilling to make operational business decisions that create controversy in this increasingly politically divided nation. Furthermore, while some businesses take their social and political missions to heart, others are only paying lip service to superficially meet consumer demand or build favorable public image. People that have an awareness of injustices in society are often called woke. When corporations manifest such an awareness through their support of social causes, and take actions to bring about positive change, it is often referred to as woke capitalism. While wokeness is meant to describe awareness of how systems of power operate in society, 
It is often stigmatized by critics who view it as a support to primarily liberal or progressive causes and as often being hypocritical and performative. Against this context, businesses are caught in a dilemma. How can businesses act responsibly given the current political climate? Should they embrace corporate activism? Should they engage in various corporate social initiatives that give expression to social causes? Or does this move risk both alienating consumers and further driving political divisions? By contrast, is activism really the role of business in society? Should businesses remain neutral or would neutrality actually abet injustice? What are the intended and unintended consequences of woke capitalism? These questions lead us to the broader issue. Should businesses take part in corporate activism or should they stay out of the fray? This is the focus of the 20th Annual Ethics and Responsible Business Forum, which will focus on the topic, woke capitalism. Should businesses jump in or stay out? The answers to the above questions will help to redefine the boundaries between economic and sociopolitical activities, as well as the roles and responsibilities of businesses in various areas. Can businesses be trusted partners in social activism? Will the profit imperative that drives businesses be an obstacle to genuine corporate social action? Should we care about whether businesses are disingenuously profiting as long as positive change is being made? I am pleased that the College of Business, the College of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, the College of Health Sciences and Human Services, and the College of Science have collaborated again to host the 20th Annual Ethics and Responsible Business Forum. By taking on the key issues of our time, such as today's topic, this annual event provides the opportunity for an outstanding interdisciplinary education in ethics for our CSUMB and adjacent communities. The event embodies the call of our founding vision to enact ethics-based leadership in service of our stakeholders. This event brings to the virtual debate table two outstanding scholars and thought leaders, Dr. Danielle Warren and Dr. Wayne Weingarten, who will argue their respective positions on the debate question. Their ideas will be engaged by questions from our expert panel, including Dr. Stacy Savataro and Mr. Emil Chappelle, as well as our own CSUMB student from the College of Business, Mr. Jacob Lopez. I am pleased to see that we are engaging the critical thinking faculties of our students and constituents, the ability to listen and think critically to form one's own opinions and inform responsible action is the touchstone of a great university and civil society. I would like to thank our debaters and panelists for their time and insights today, which will provide us with an illuminating dialogue on woke capitalism. Thanks also to the Cross College Organizing Committee and the deans and faculty members of the four participating colleges for organizing this forum on this pressing topic. Thank you. And now I ask our MC extraordinaire, Professor Jeff Froshman of the College of Business to launch the forum. And now giving her welcome and greetings, our CSUMB Provost, Dr. Catherine Katarja. Thank you, Professor Froshman. And thank you, Dean Shockley and all the deans. On behalf of Academic Affairs, I'm very pleased to also welcome all of you to this year's and the 20th Annual Ethics and Responsible Business Forum. And my remarks, I think, are going to be a little more targeted to all of the students who are, are in the audience today and participating in this event. You know, the role of the provost at a university is as the chief academic officer and my, and my responsibility is for academic affairs and allocating the resources required to meet our strategic priorities in academic affairs. The obligation is to uphold academic integrity and to ensure, protect and advance equitable student success. And our overarching goal as higher educators here at CSU Monterey Bay is to provide an exciting high quality education that enables you, our students to discover create, transmit, and apply knowledge, and thereby reach your highest potential. And in addition to providing academic rigor and helping you gain important life skills, we know the importance of and place great value on experiential learning in all its forms. Learning doesn't just take place in the classroom. In addition to participating in experiences that apply the knowledge you've acquired in the classroom, participation in events such as this forum provide invaluable experience outside the classroom, 
where you have the opportunity to see and hear various points of view about topics of critical importance to your discipline and your future career. At this year's event, as you've heard many already say, the keynote speakers will debate whether businesses should influence the moral and political life of citizens and to what extent they should do that. The panelists will probe how different types of corporate involvement in the moral and political sphere can impact society in positive or negative ways. I sincerely hope that you will listen for understanding and treat everything you hear as an opportunity to learn and to grow. Before we begin, we would be remiss if we did not do a shout out and thanks to the wonderful organizing committee who have worked hours to put this program together. First, our co-chairs are Dr. Angie Naraswari and Dr. Caleb Bernacci. Committee members are Jennifer Andrews, Dr. Leslie Bonai, Dr. Kevin Cahill, Dr. Vanessa Lopez Littleton, Linda McDonald Glenn, Merdula Mascarenas, Dean Mary Lou Shockley, Sherry Rainwater, Dr. Paige Viren, Susan Mangan, Marlena Rose, and Jennifer Hines. Here's what our agenda this afternoon looks like. I will introduce our distinguished keynote speakers, and each speaker will present for 12 minutes. When finished, I will introduce our esteemed three panelists. Each panelist will have five minutes for their remarks. Then for the next half hour or so, the panelists will engage with our keynote speakers. Our final time will be spent with audience questions. So let us begin. Our first keynote is Dr. Danielle Warren. Dr. Warren is a professor of management and global business at Rutgers Business School, the State University of New Jersey. Professor Warren researches why deviance arises in business settings, how to evaluate it, and how to deter destructive deviance while promoting constructive deviance. She has published numerous articles on business ethics and ethical leadership in leading academic journals and business press. Our next keynote will be Dr. Wayne Weingarten. Dr. Weingarten is a senior fellow in business and economics at the Pacific Research Institute as well as the director of the Institute Center for Medical Economics and Innovation. The Pacific Research Institute champions freedom, opportunity, and personal responsibility for all individuals by advancing free market policy solutions. Dr. Weingarten's columns have been published in the Wall Street Journal, Chicago Tribune, Investors Business Daily, Forbes.com, and USA Today. Dr. Warren, would you please begin? Thank you so much for that introduction. And I want to uh, welcome you all to my presentation today. Um, I am going to be arguing in favor of woke corporations or woke capitalism. I start my talk by examining what we mean when we say woke. And after examining what we mean when we say woke, I consider which firms have been labeled woke as well as which firms are accused of woke washing. Because I think it's very important that we appreciate that there's not just one set of critics scrutinizing corporate social initiatives. Um, then I consider if corporate inaction is an effective way to avoid criticism. Um, I conclude by arguing that businesses should jump in and adopt corporate social initiatives, even if they may cause the firm to be labeled woke or uh, accused of woke washing. I want to note that the ideas that I'm going to be presenting today are based upon an article that was recently published. And so what I'm going to be doing is condensing 30 pages of ideas into 12 minutes. Um, but I've timed it and I believe I can pull it off. Uh, so I'll, I'll try, I will start the presentation by um, giving you some definitions. So first, what do we mean by corporate social initiatives? Corporate social initiatives are voluntary corporate activities that are aimed at improving or addressing a social or environmental issue. It entails a commitment of resources such as products, services, volunteer time, or cash, 
over a period of time. They extend beyond a one-time cash donation. And so, for example, in response to the pandemic, the company Alphabet customized search results for online queries regarding COVID-19, and they added vaccination locations to Google Maps. They also provided ad credits uh, for health organizations. So those are examples of some corporate social initiatives we might have seen in the last year. Next, I, I address the, uh, well, I'll give you a set of definitions for woke. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the term woke, I'll provide some background. So originally the term was used to signal something positive. It meant to alert to injustice and discrimination in society, especially racism. It meant to be self-aware, questioning the dominant paradigm and striving for something better. It meant to be well-informed, up-to-date. Um, these all sound very positive, and if someone referred to you as woke, you would probably think it was a compliment. So you may be wondering, how is it that now, recently, we've been seeing uh, the term woke being used in an insulting way? And I like to think of this in terms of two sets of critics. So we have two camps that are using the woke language. On the one hand, we have the critics who believe firms are engaging too much with a social issue. They will refer to a firm as woke. On the other end of the spectrum, we have critics who think firms are not engaging enough with a social issue, and they may refer to a firm as woke washing. So the first set of critics believe firms that engage in these initiatives are entering territory, woke territory that is not appropriate for business. The second set of critics believe that firms are not doing enough. The firms are pretending to be woke by saying they care about social issues or society, but they are only engaging in woke washing. It's important to acknowledge both sets of critics if we're going to talk about woke corporations and woke capitalism, because a firm may receive criticism from either or both camps. So on a daily basis, we see both sets of critics asserting their views in our publications. So it wouldn't be uncommon on an, any given day to see these two sets of headlines. Woke washing, your company won't cut it. And at the same time, we see another publication, get woke, go broke. Now I want to spend some time considering the perspectives behind these headlines. First, let's consider woke washing. We can look at an article from Forbes this past summer. Here the author writes, woke washing is a term used to define practices in business that provide the appearance of social consciousness without any of the substance. A woke washed business could theoretically promote the opposite of racial equality within its walls while championing causes of social justice to the outside world. We see the consequences of woke washing in response to companies taking a position related to Black Lives Matter. And so what we see, uh, for example, is that corporations that publicly stated support for Black Lives Matter are now experiencing pressure from state uh, shareholder activists to provide more meaningful reporting on DEI within their organizations. And in the last year, many shareholders have voted to adopt more detailed DEI reporting on firms' demographics. At the same time, we see new investment vehicles like this. The American Conservative Values Investment Fund, which boycotts the same firms for activities related to DEI. And so we can see they have this list of firms uh, that they're boycotting and they refer to them as the companies most hostile to conservative values, the worst of the worst. Thus a balancing act exists. Firms must navigate two camps. This balancing act is nicely captured in a 2019 article regarding Gay Pride Month. It starts with a provocative title, Why Brands Should Not Take a Political Stand in the Internet Age. I want to read some excerpts that will highlight the difficulties firms suffer or face by taking a stand on an issue. The author writes, 
Brands that take the popular side of an issue for good PR can find themselves in hot water when customers realize that the company does little to support that cause. The brand then gets accused of woke washing, acting like it's socially conscious, when in fact, it is using the cause for good press and to stir up goodwill among customers. Pride has become a prime example of a woke washing trend. Brands from Listerine to Chipotle sport rainbow branding during June. Once the month ends, the branding disappears, leaving LGBT plus customers wondering if these brands supported their community or just used them for attention. If brands are going to plant their flag behind a cause, they have to take serious steps to support that cause. Sometimes it's better to refrain from picking a cause. The author uh, continues by saying there's no winning side. When a brand is choosing a side on a political issue, it ultimately is choosing to alienate 50% of the population that is on the other side of the issue. Global billion dollar companies like Nike are able to take the a negative attention that comes from something like the Colin Kaepernick campaign. Nike is an outlier. Most brands can't afford to lose half the population or suffer the loss in profits that comes from a boycott. By choosing not to engage in political debates, brands may lose out on a small amount of media attention or support from a very vocal subset of people. In addition, they may avoid, they avoid the backlash that is bound to come from the other side of the debate. And so arguments like this have led firms such as Coinbase to avoid the backlash, or they're hoping to avoid the backlash by staying silent. And so we saw last year Coinbase, the CEO posted this on his blog, and he, he told the employees, we won't debate causes or political candidates internally that are unrelated to work. We won't expect the company to represent our personal beliefs externally. We won't assume negative intent, intent or not have each other's back. We won't take on activism outside of our core mission at work. A follow-up blog post from the CEO indicated some employee backlash associated with this position. And uh, the CEO goes on to explain that I wanted to share that about 5% of employees, 60 of them, have decided to take an exit package. There were a handful of other conversations still ongoing, so the final number may be a bit higher. Uh, he said that it was reassuring to see that people from underrepresented groups at Coinbase have not taken the exit package in numbers disproportionate to the overall population. Similarly, you may have heard that Basecamp also banned these conversations. Also a post from their CEO where he says Basecamp should be a place where employees can come to work with colleagues of all backgrounds and political convictions without having to deal with the heavy political or societal debates unconnected to that work. He goes on and says by saying, by trying to have debates around such incredibly sensitive societal politics inside the company, we're setting ourselves up for strife with little chance of actually changing anyone's mind. These types of discussions are so difficult that even if we were having them at the best of times together in person with trust batteries fully charged, we'd struggle. And we have none of those advantages right now. So it's not a surprise that the results have been poor. And in response to the CEO's decision, we read about the following outcomes. How you might have seen this headline, how Basecamp blew up inside the all hands meeting that led a third of the company to quit and an executive to resign. More recently, we have seen stakeholders demanding action uh, by U.S. firms in relation to Russia. And so in the last week, you probably saw uh, some of these headlines where we have consumers calling for boycotts. There's a widely shared list of U.S. companies leaving and staying in Russia and, and holding business leaders accountable. 
And it's not surprising to hear that consumers and employees are pushing firms to act if we look at the Edelman Trust Barometer, an annual global survey, because what we see, um, this annual report gauges attitudes of a global sample of th over 30,000 individuals on a variety of topics. And the recent survey suggests that citizens want CEOs and businesses to be involved in civic life. We see that 81% of those surveyed felt CEOs should be personally visible when discussing public policy with external stakeholders or work their company has done to benefit society. 60% agreed to the item that stated, when considering a job, I expect the CEO to speak publicly about controversial social and political issues that I care about. So these data suggest that individuals want firms to be woke. Um, we just heard about employees who wanted their firms to be woke. Uh, and growth in socially responsible investments suggests that investors are drawn to woke corporations, which leads me to my final slide. I conclude by saying businesses should feel free to jump in. Um, they. We need to appreciate there is not just one set of critics scrutinizing corporate social initiatives. Woke washing critics may say your firm isn't doing enough. And inaction is criticized too. It doesn't appear to be the solution. Um, and so even if you don't get woke, you can still go broke. So uh, that's it for my formal presentation. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Well, thank you, Danielle. And now, Dr. Weingarten, the camera and microphone are now yours. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. And so really, it's an honor to be here. Um, and you know, I, I'm actually of the opposite position. No, no surprise. This is a debate. Uh, but no, I, I don't believe companies should embrace woke capitalism. And, and I think the reason is simple. Uh, we need to judge uh, you know, policies and actions by companies on their outcomes, not their intentions. And when we look at the outcomes of what's happening, and I think a lot of the slides actually back these, these up, that when you embrace woke capitalism, it's not possible to achieve, you know, there's many noble outcomes that people are trying to achieve. It's not possible to accomplish that and, and making the matters worse by embracing woke capitalism. What we're actually going to be, end up doing is undermining the health of, of businesses and that are engaging in the programs. And in, in, in doing that, we're gonna be undermining many of the very goals that actually we say we wanna achieve when we talk about woke capitalism or wokeism or all, all these different issues. Now, I think what's very important to, uh, when we're talking about woke capitalism is trying to nail down kind of a precise definition of what we're talking about. And in fact, we could spend this whole three hours talking about the vagaries of woke capitalism. And that in and of itself is a reason why it's very difficult to engage uh, in woke capitalism programs. When you can't measure something very specifically, when you can't define it clearly, it becomes almost impossible for a company to implement it well. But if we put those issues down, and I think there are enough kind of definitions of woke capitalism for us to work with, and in and, and, and this I'm very much in agreement with Dr. Warren, that you know, a fair definition is that woke capitalism is imploring businesses to help achieve social goals. These typically include helping the environment, particularly with respect to the dangers posed by global climate change, uh, helping alleviate poverty, addressing racial issues, promoting economic development, and broadly speaking, and I think this is the most important reason why there's uh, uh, problems or dangers from woke capitalism, is that companies have to serve the needs of uh, a broader community. So you have stakeholders, which are more than just your shareholders, employees, and customers, which is what your stakeholders are in traditional kind of uh, free market competition or free market capitalism. Uh, you now have a broader community that is also a stakeholder. And that broader community, that vague kind of notion is where many of the unintended but adverse consequences from uh, trying to implore a woke uh, capitalism in, in, in a business strategy comes into play. So uh, again, the I guess major kind of number one issue, I think that when we're talking about woke capitalism that we have to recognize is that where woke capitalism can have some value, 
right? And people look, you know, you look at a uh, demand for uh, products like cage-free eggs or electric vehicles. And these uh, products, the, the, the existence of these markets create this uh, justification that woke capitalism is, is a good thing. But any in any place where woke capitalism enhances profits, right? One of the one of the arguments people will consistently make is that woke capitalism enhances the profits of a company. But in any instance where woke capitalism can enhance profits, right, then it's repetitive to the actual free market competition, which is the basis of society. So where woke capitalism practices or profit maximizing, we don't need the concept of woke capitalism, right? We could do that uh, just by uh, applying uh, typical or normal uh, business practices. Um, and, and I guess the problem with these assertions, if, if I can just emphasize that for a moment, is that businesses, we know all about maximizing profits. And in fact, it's contradictory to argue that on the one hand, business people are not altruistic enough, but then on the other hand, that even though they only care about profits, that they're unable to see how they can earn more profits by taking better care of their employees or ensuring that the production processes are aligned with society's values or pursuing any other of the woke capitalist goals. If there are ways to increase profits through using woke means, woke washing, whatever you want to refer to it, profit maximizing firms are going to find them. Right. Businesses don't need a new theory of capitalism to create practices or to create new practices that will enhance profits. So I think that's the first point, right? Therefore, a theory of woke capitalism is unnecessary in all instances where woke capitalism uh, increases profits. Whether it's paying employees more, providing more benefits, using low emission energy sources, uh, selling, uh, selling sustainable products, uh, following the precepts of free market capitalism is going to guide businesses to pursue these strategies. So if we accept that, that there's an inherent contradiction, that if um, uh, free market capitalism will lead businesses to these profit maximizing kind of woke goals, then a theory of woke capitalism is unnecessary in those instances, and its only value can be justified because it creates some sort of other benefit. Right? If we put it differently, the, the theory of world capitalism is only valid if it encourages businesses to pursue strategies and practices that create value despite being detrimental to profits. Okay. Um, th this, this assertion from world capitalism that businesses have responsibility to shareholders is essentially kind of where that comes, comes into play. The idea that uh, according to shareholder, uh, I'm sorry, according to stakeholder theory, uh, businesses shouldn't just serve the interests of their shareholders, right? They need to serve the needs of all the stakeholders, their employees, their customers, and the broader community. And it's that broader community, which is the contribution of world capitalism. Right? Because again, traditional free market approaches ensure that the interests of employees, customers, and um, shareholders are going to be considered. Right, Treating employees well and serving the needs of customers is essential if you're going to earn healthy profits and fulfill your purpose of providing strong return for shareholders. So there's no need for woke capitalist theory to ensure that the interests of employees, customers, or shareholders are going to be served. I think it's also very important to note here when we're talking about your role in society, right? Uh, free market business arrangements historically serve an incredibly important social role, right? Competitive free markets promote broad-based prosperity. They promote income growth. And that prosperity, that income growth has meaningfully improved our quality of life in the U.S., and globally, if you look at just over the last 20, 30 years, where a billion people were lifted out of poverty, that was from free market capitalism, right? It sustainably reduces poverty. It lifts people up across the spectrum, right? That income growth is also the basis for investors. And if we think of securing the retirement, right, we have uh, the baby boom generation moving, it's actually already retiring. If we're going to secure the retirement of hundreds of millions of workers, we need a sound um, uh, economy. We need strong returns. That's the job of, of, of corporate businesses. And if we interfere with that, right, especially when we look at uh, some of the under uh, underfunded public pensions, 
right? We need strong returns. If we interfere with that, we're actually going to be risking a secure retirement for, for hundreds of millions of Americans. So that's an important social role that they play. And then also the business community provides uh, the, the basis uh, for our tax revenues. So all the income, the spending, the profits that is generated from business activity, that forms the basis from which we can get the tax revenues to provide all of the necessary public goods. So the free market economy is essential for achieving many of the goals that we're talking about when we're talking about world capitalism, right? And, and that's important because if we're going to hurt the performance of the companies, then what we're actually doing is hurting the ability of, uh, of us as a society to, to reach these important goals. And the one stakeholder, by the way, I haven't mentioned yet, and that's on purpose, is the idea of this broader community, right? Because under uh, the free market capitalism, you don't have that as one of your uh, core stakeholders, right? And when we carefully consider the, all, all the other claims of world capitalism, those are all covered on, on, on basic free market uh, uh, principles. So then the only purpose, now that we've kind of narrowed it down, the only purpose of woke capitalism is to transfer rights from shareholders to stakeholders. And granting these rights to a vaguely defined stakeholder community is going to fundamentally misalign the business incentives that undermines the ability of businesses to fill that important social purpose that we just talked about. And, and I should note up front, right, that this doesn't imply businesses ha don't have responsibilities, right? Laws exist to ensure that businesses don't engage in practices uh, that harm the local community. Uh, you know, enforcing laws is the proper role of the federal, state, and local governments uh, when it comes to pollution, when it comes to violating securities laws. You know, when companies do that, when they violate the laws, they should and must be held accountable. However, granting ownership type rights to the broader community, people who don't have an interest in whether the company succeeds, creates a fundamental misalignment of incentives. These groups face no trade-offs. There's no reason for them to compromise on their demands, regardless of the impacts that they could have in the business, its owners, its employees, or customers. So granting rights to such disinterested parties is going to create significant risk that policies that are harmful to the business uh, and harmful to its long-term viability is going to be implemented. And those policies obviously will undermine the business performance. Uh, make, making these matters worse, right? All, all, all that I've said is talking as if the broader community is a monolithic group of stakeholders, but nothing could be further from the truth. There are, there are so many issues that divide local communities as well as our broader nation, you know, and whether it's taking the stand on contentious issues like abortion or gun rights or addressing local questions as to whether zoning laws should be altered to accommodate like an, a plant expansion. It's just impossible for businesses to align themselves with the opinion of the broader community because for most issues, there is no opinion of the broader community. So we've established not only a vague goal, but a goal that's impossible to achieve. Uh, I, I know I'm beginning to run out of time, but I, I, as a final concern, I, I think it's important that to recognize that world capitalism also subvert, uh, subverts uh, the kind of investor uh, uh, processes and political processes. Uh, and, and very quickly kind of going through those, if we start with the investors, right, unless they have explicitly allocated a fund to an environmental, social and governance fund, an ESG fund, then only the nexus among investors is that investment. Uh, you know, and if it's in a defined bench, uh, benefit pension plan, you kind of you're stuck in that investment. You can't change uh, where your money is being allocated. So that the fiduciary responsibility, the only common nexus across all of these individuals, is the returns of that fund. So if you haven't put your money in an ESG fund, then the the goal of that fund, the only common goal, is the return. And if you're pursuing political goals, you're then violating that fiduciary responsibility if that is coming at the expense of um, uh, investment returns. And that's especially the case if we're talking about political goals that could possibly uh, contradict an individual's uh, personal beliefs. Uh, with respect to roles of corporations uh, and the government, right, the purpose of electing our representatives to Congress and, and, and state houses is to address these pre uh, pressing political issues. Uh, if using companies to implement broad political policies is undermining the role of the government. It's disempowering the voting public in favor of corporate boardrooms. And, and I think clearly 
such an outcome is un, un, unwelcome. We don't want corporations setting our, our policies. Uh, we want gov- we want government out of corporations, corporations out of government. So I guess to summarize what my, my point is in terms of why businesses should stay out is that the purpose of woke capitalism is to change how free market capitalism operates. Uh, but where it's beneficial, where world capitalism is beneficial, it doesn't bring anything new. Uh, profit maximizing companies are going to pursue those uh, profit um, maximizing or profit enabled woke goals. Uh, where woke capitalism is new, however, then it's not bringing anything be- beneficial because woke capitalism is designed to advance the interests of a predefined group. And that predefined group is usually the noisiest stakeholders. Uh, and and, and in, in my mind, that's best understood. The noisiest stakeholders is best understood as a form of, of crony capitalism. And history demonstrates that where co- crony capitalism thrives, uh, broad-based prosperity growth stagnates, and that has deleterious impacts on the goals of economic development, rising worker welfare. And, and these losses are perhaps uh, woke capitalism's uh, costliest impacts of all. Uh, and with that, I'd like to you know, thank you for the time and, and turn things back over to Jess. All right, thank you, Wayne. It is my pleasure to now introduce our three panelists. First, Amir Chappell. Mr. Chappell is a policy analyst at the National Institute of Criminal Justice Reform. He coordinates projects with local government agencies and conducts research in the fields of criminal and juvenile justice youth development, violence reduction, and organizational development. Amir has been directly impacted by the criminal justice system as a formerly incarcerated person who transformed his life as a young man to have a successful professional career. Our second panelist is Jacob Lopez. Mr. Lopez is a student here at California State University, Monterey Bay. He is majoring in business administration with a concentration in information systems. Jacob also has a passion for current topics in relation to politics and business ethics, much like today's topic of woke capitalism. Through courses at CSUMB, such as business ethics and race and ethnicity in the United States, Jacob has discussed the impact businesses have on socio-political issues under capitalism. Our third panelist is Dr. Stacy Zavataro. Dr. Zavataro is a professor of public administration at University of Central Florida. Her books include Cities for Sale, Place Branding Through Phases of the Image, and Social Media to Government Theory and Practice. She serves as editor in chief of the International Journal, Administrative Theory and Praxis. Her writings have appeared in many professional journals. Amir, would you please begin your presentation? Uh, Thank you, Professor Froshman. Thank you, everyone, esteemed uh, committee, members of the public and others. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate how Danielle uh, started off with the definition of woke capitalism. You know, uh, actually for me, the term woke first came into my purview in the 90s in, in urban music. Like, you woke now. We woke. And, uh, and really, it, it, it is like you're ready. You, you're, you see what's happening. You, you got to be woke when you're walking through the community with high levels of gun violence. If you're not, you might fall into some trouble. So I really appreciate the definitions that you laid out there. And what I heard here today was very intriguing to me and, and very interesting to me, considering I'm not a business professional, but like I told some folks, I understand supply and demand. And you know, the woke washing that's happening, I haven't heard that term. I appreciate that term as well. The the woke wash, and I'm gonna get to what Dr. Weingarten Wayne was saying too, because he said a lot of things. He used the term broader community and he used like terms like ESG fund. Unfortunately, uh, I don't know if he said ESG or ESF or D, it's one of those funds and unfortunately, even though I consider myself educated and understand some things, I have no idea what an ESG fund is. And I'm willing to bet there's a lot of people on this call right now that don't know what an ESG fund is. And when, when he was talking about the broader community, the part of the community that came to my mind that is not part of that broader community 
is the same parts of the community that are most impacted, have no economic opportunity. There's divestment from corporations. But at the same time, what Dr. Warren was saying, the woke washing is also happening by those same corporations. Uh, you know, uh, since the murder of George Floyd, American companies committed about $50 billion <clears throat> to different organizations. But most of that money came in the form of investments and loans. And that's what gets back to what Dr. Weingartner was talking about with that profit maximizing. We're gonna put out the money and give it to these black and brown communities, but we're also gonna profit off them at, at the same, in the same term. We're, we're gonna support you and profit off you at the same time. And, and that's somewhat problematic. But really, the, to me, regardless of the research, corporations have been responsible for a lot of the destruction of, of this nation. Capitalism caused forcibly enslaved Black people to come to America. Capitalism caused the massacre and stealing of lands of thousands of Native Americans in the name of capitalism, in the name of building railroads, westward expansion, and all these things. McDonald's, Visa, and these other companies pull out of Ukraine, but Woe is me if an employee at McDonald's doesn't want to serve a law enforcement officer for killing black people in our community. And so this, this is a problem for me. And, and I really appreciate um, the opportunity to ask our esteemed speakers questions. I listen, I learn, and I value what they brought to the table. And what I'm bringing to the table is the voice of the unheard. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Amir. Jacob, can you please give us your remarks now? Hi, I want to uh, just first off, thank everyone for um, coming and participating in this wonderful ethics forum with this very important topic, talking or addressing some of what Amir uh, said before me, I completely agree with a lot of his statements about um, woke washing and its effects on um, social movements, uh, specifically progressive social movements um, in, the, in the current day, because I believe that a lot of what we see with businesses currently is co-opting of these movements and taking advantage of these movements. Uh, specifically with Black Lives Matter, um, you see a lot of businesses donating to them in what I believe is an attempt to almost buy them out and get them to believe that corporations are on their side when historically they have purposefully, um, along with the state, have tried to keep uh, Black individuals in an impoverished state uh, because capitalism needs to thrive off of some sort of social hierarchy. It divides the working class, um, specifically working class whites, from uh, other minority groups to um, try and attempt to make sure that they don't um, have some sort of solidarity. Uh, capitalism puts um, almost criminalizes poverty in a way where it thrives off of um, taking people who can't be supported by the system, that the system isn't able to foster, essentially. These people don't have the resources to move up. They don't have the ability to move up in the system, and that's by design. So we take these people and we push them aside. We push them into the prison system. We make sure that they are taken away from public view so that workers feel more like uh, the system is working for them. They feel like capitalism is on their side, it is benefiting them, because at least they aren't this lower class impoverished group that has been crafted throughout the history of the United States. As the US, we make up about 5% of the world's population, and yet we have 25% of the world's incarcerated individuals. I believe this is by design, as capitalism cannot support these people, and we must push them out of the social sphere. I wanted to address um, some of the differences between um, liberal corporations versus more conservative focused corporations. And I believe that this is very similar um, in both camps where liberal corporations want to try and save face with these social movements, um, kind of co-opt them, put out their imaging, uh, profitize their um, basically their image, right? Uh, they sell Black Lives Matter merchandise, they sell Pride merchandise in order to profit off of these groups and make people think that the issue is being addressed, that these corporations have come in, they've um, taken this mantle up on their own, and that they are 
kind of our political system, that they are our immediate political system and that they will be addressing these movements. And now everyone else can move on. The problem is solved. We don't need to bargain for better wages. We don't need to bargain for better quality of life. Uh, we just have to live with injustices like housing, jobs, health care. We have injustices in um, police reform, et cetera, that do not get addressed. They get uh, Band-Aid solutions that make people believe that everything is A-OK -okay and that we don't have to do anything about it. Um, to address the different camps of um, you know, viewing it as woke washing or just woke corporations, I would say that woke washing is very detrimental in a way to a lot of these social movements because uh, these social movements need their own room to be heard and to continue to be heard and continue to have that support. And we don't want the general population to think that they, these issues are now trivial. They have been solved. They don't need any more um, elaboration. We have systems in place that have solved them when in reality, that's just not the case. We still have tons of people, tons of families, um, women and children on the, street, on the street starving in the United States with a system that is supposed to lift people out of poverty the most We've seen in the previous years that wealth inequality has just gotten even worse. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your time and listening, uh, and I look forward to hearing more perspectives on the topic. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jacob. Stacy, would you please give us your remarks? Yes, and thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. I, I echo everyone's sentiments. It's my honor to be here. And I'm so actually glad that I'm going after Amir and Jacob who kind of just were able to help me get my brain a little bit together by what they said. And I think, um, as you heard, you know, Professor Froshman say, I'm a professor of public administration. So it sounds like I bring that um, stakeholder group <laughs> to the table that was sort of forgotten um, or potentially dismissed in one of the other presentations. And so it gets at what Jacob was just saying of, you know, from the policy perspective, when you're looking at wokeness, I'm coming from it from a recent article that I have just published. And hey, Dr. Lopez Littleton, I know you're here. Um, thank you for inviting me. So in that piece, what we tried to do was really look at sort of the language and the images that everybody who's spoken before me has, you know, looked at and used. So what we tried to do was step back and look at the term, the word, and the rhetoric surrounding woke. Cause like, you know, Amir, you know, I heard it in songs, Erica Badu, right? And then all of a sudden now, you know, as Amir was saying, it's, it's everywhere. So what my colleague and I tried to do is say, okay, where did this word come from? Just rhetorically, where did this come from? And so what we argue is the term woke. And now everything that's getting sort of looped into it, which is leading to a lot of the ineffective ways of addressing a lot of the policy issues that you know Jacob said again in, within that system of capitalism that is supposed to you know lift the, the rising tide that's supposed to lift all boats if you will so what we tried to do is say there's when you when you look from a policy again perspective if you're looking at sort of woke in this in the essence of you know being alert to something you get something like the civil rights act that tries it's not perfect tries to put in place, you know, mechanisms to start breaking down some of those structural barriers. Then you sort of move forward, you know, through time and you get policies like affirmative action, <clears throat> equal employment opportunity that again, try, but then you see some backlash coming, right? You see Supreme Court cases coming. You see now we can't have, you know, these kinds of hiring practices, okay? So now you have, you know, the term that is moving from its roots to creating sort of spaces or trying to create spaces and dismantling spaces to now today, where I'm sure folks on this call watched some of the Supreme Court hearings, the confirmation hearings. Yesterday, you saw senators saying, hey, look at these books. What do you think of those? Has nothing to do with necessarily the job. Um, but it's become so unmoored, the word and everything associated with it has become so unmoored from the roots, from the word woke and its associated images in the black community 
that today it doesn't have to mean anything. The term doesn't have to mean anything. So that's both of the keynote speakers kind of hit on this is when you put the word woke in front of anything, <laughs> in this case, capitalism, it sets off triggers purposefully and intentionally. So I'm hoping some of the panelists and can address a question that I have related to this because that word is there to get you to act or as Jacob was saying, to not act. And that's where the role of the policy comes in. So I will stop my time and um, I'm, I'm like, like Amir and Jacob, I'm looking forward to a, a healthy and robust discussion. So again, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Stacy. And now for our next half hour, our panelists will engage with our keynote speakers. This will be a free flowing session where ideas and comments may be challenged and more deeply probed. So Amir, would you kindly begin with your follow-up remarks, comments, or questions? Thank you, Professor Froshman. Um, I guess my first question is for Dr. Weingarten. And, um, and he mentioned that, you know, woke capitalism subverts investor communities and political processes. And I know one of the commenters in, in the chat or in the Q&A um, was saying, they brought up the Citizens United ruling. In, in, in the Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission, it was overturned in 2010. Um, and ultimately, corporations are still influencing policy decisions, influencing a, a host of things by putting these people in seats of power, right? Without even uh, donating a dime to the cause per se, but they're donating millions and billions of dollars to like the NRA and different senators and reps that support these different things. So I was curious um, as to what your thoughts are between the differences between the concept of donating millions and billions of dollars of political candidates and how that is a form of from, as what I see it as a form of woke capitalism versus um, the academic theoretical um, idea of what woke capitalism is. Do you see a difference between those two? I think I'm going to answer your question, please, you know, if, if I'm not, let, you know, we, we can come back. But if your question is, you know, about all of the different, uh, I guess, power you is a way to summarize perhaps what you're saying in terms of corporate America with respect to what's happening in policy. I agree that we need to actually we want we want to get government out of business and business out of government. And so that the the less expansive we have of the government in terms of trying to uh, micromanage what businesses are doing, you're also then going to have less of an incentive for a company to be worrying about what's happening in Washington, D.C. But the, the basic fact is that if a policy is being debated in Congress, and that is going to cost, you know, over 25 years, a discounted present value of billions of dollars, it would be derelict of the company not to express you know what their position is because that has a material impact on their operation so explicitly when we're talking about this issue of kind of lobbying and corporations being involved the more uh we can have government fulfill its role and stay within its bounds and the more we then be able to have corporations stay within their bounds and i 100 percent agree with you we could actually get a much better outcome if we can move toward that type of system. I think that's actually in, in, in my worldview where we really need to be working toward. I mean, I guess to follow on if I'm allowed, how do we do that in a space where to Amir's point, corporations are people. So how do we get to that, that nexus that you were talking about? Well, corporations aren't necessarily people, right? They, they are something, but they're comprised of individuals. But, you know, part of that is, you know, it, it's going through each one. I mean, one of the things Amir had mentioned, and it's 100 percent true, our income support programs are, are a failure. Right. And so we have lots of problems that arise from that. The more we can start working on fixing the income support issues coming up with it here in California. Right. We've had horrible policies that have helped uh, uh, the homeless population explode. And we've, we're failing that group. So the more we can get these policies right. Right. The more we can get our tax policies right, our regulatory policies right uh, and, and create stability there. That, that's the way and you got to do one kind of one uh, issue at a time. But that 
that's the way to kind of start to separate uh, these issues. What we've seen, and actually, you know, Amir talked about this in terms of like the 1800s, it's cronyism, it's crony capitalism that has actually led to so many of the bad outcomes. Because anytime you have the power of the government able to get behind uh, and, and promote the interests of a small group, uh, inevitably, even if the group starts off with good, good intentions, inevitably it goes in the wrong direction. And so that's, that's what most importantly we need to guard against. Can you define crony capitalism? Because I think you're using it in a different way than I think of it. So could you give us your definition? My definition of cronyism would be, oh, crony capitalism oh, cron is, yeah. Where, yeah, crony capitalism is when you're actually having, and um, apologies, this is not uh, too precise because I don't have, but uh, you have the government policies that are explicitly, you know, influenced by, um, specific groups and getting favors, specific favors from uh, or for specific groups uh, outside of, uh, and this is where you're going to have certain vagaries, right? But you have externalities, right? So that something government needs to get involved with through tax regulatory policy, whatever the case may be, uh, you know, that is something different. But when you have government favoring the economic interests of one group at the expense of another, that's where you start getting into that crony capitalism. When you have government uh, favoring that one industry or uh, hurting and uh, handicapping other industries or other people. That's what you're talking about, corny capitalism. Um, I'm gonna let my other colleagues speak, but just for my mind, uh, Dr. Weingarten, is an example of crony capitalism redlining where the government supported banks in drawing districts around certain communities where those lenders would therefore not loan money to black folks. Um, is, is that a form of crony capitalism where the government supported the lending industry and in being able to do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, I just wanted to be clear in, a, in an applied example of what you were referencing just, just for myself, because that's how I learned. Uh, but right. I, I, I know Jacob has a lot of questions. Yeah, hi. Um, I want to have or ask a follow-up question to Dr. Weingartner. So um, if you believe that crony capitalism and um, increased government involvement has led to um, like increases in poverty or uh, has stopped us from uplifting people in poverty, how come the U.S. compared to other OECD nations has the worst standard of living when we have the least amount of social problem or uh, social uh, um, like resources, social programs, I should say? Um, and I know some people will, uh, you know, try to compare standard of living based on uh, the items that people have at the lower end of the poverty spectrum. But I would also like you to keep in mind when, with your response that 2 million people in the United States are locked away in prisons. So they don't actually really represent uh, the poor population in most people's eyes. Well, I, 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 I need to object when you're saying the U.S. has a lower standard of living for the poor. That's that's simply not true. Um, so that that's not. Uh, if I could elaborate, correct. if I could elaborate, I, I said specifically compared to other uh, OECD nations. That means comparable nations. Yeah, against comparable nations, that's 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 still not true. Um, but you know, and you you also have to if you're talking about the people who are in prison. That is a a problem it is a different problem it is needs to be addressed but when we're talking about getting the kind of uh, policy that's going to help individuals at the lower end we need a perfect example if I, if I can uh, entrepreneurship and we've done uh, at, at PRR we've done a lot of studies looking at entrepreneurship and if you look at the income you look at the wealth of entrepreneurs entrepreneurs of color entrepreneurs from low income women entrepreneurs, they are significantly better off in terms of both where they are and in terms of their growth over time. So here's a, you know, a way if we can support entrepreneurship and especially small entrepreneurship, and if we can address the regulatory barriers that are preventing the capital, because when you look at what are some of the largest problems entrepreneurs have or low-income individuals have, especially starting a business, credit constraints are one of the biggest issues. And so if we can address some of that gets to the redlining that, that Amir had, had uh, mentioned, that would actually do a, a, a tremendous amount of help in terms of helping increase that income at the lower end. In, in, in my view, income inequality isn't nearly as important of an issue as income growth 
at the lower end. And as long as we're getting in, in real sustained income growth at the lower end so that people are appreciably better, if, I can, if, if we can have a, a, a society where people tomorrow in the low income class are living as well as people in the upper income class today, I don't care what happens to the income of people in the upper class. It can go as high as, as wherever it goes. We're making people better off. We're, we're in economic terms, right? This is a Pareto optimal uh, improvement if, if that person continues to get better off. And that to me is an important goal. Entrepreneurship is such an important pathway for doing that. And we have actually a, uh, a, um, a tradition of much greater entrepreneurship and support for entrepreneurship. We need to improve those incentives and improve the, uh, the capital allocation so those can continue to thrive. I'd like to give Daniel uh, a chance to uh, respond. So Daniel, can you uh, throw in a few words here too, please? In terms of the questions that were just posed by Jacob or? Yeah, in yeah. Terms and the comments that uh, Wayne fed back over at Jacob, what your opinion might be of uh, some of those comments that Wayne gave us. So I have comments about what Wayne said earlier, but I will focus on, um, I mean, I, I guess one of the questions that I would actually pose to Wayne, uh, which I'm supposed to be answering a question, but I'm going to pose a question is, it, but it relates to what he's just saying right now is that are people in, who are living in poverty today better than those who were in poverty, say, 50 years ago? Yes. If you look at the consumption um, basket what, that they have. Their consumption, so their opportunities for consuming are better? Absolutely. But what about their overall standard of living? Are you talking non-economic issues? I mean, there's certainly the social problems that need to be addressed. I'm just, if, if that's, yeah, because I'm curious about this idea. That, you know, what you were just presenting was this idea that if the person that is living uh, in, in poverty today is better off tomorrow, you don't care how high the income goes for the wealthy in the future. And I'm just wondering if retrospectively, if if we've seen that. I, I understand. Right. I think what's happening is what's blending together is an argument in favor of capitalism with this conversation about whether or not firms choose to engage in certain sorts of social initiatives. And so it's like a defense of capitalism in general. And your defense of a capitalism is overall people uh, are going to be better off even if they are living in poverty. And, and I guess what I'm trying to say is, or I'm asking, can we look back and say that's the case? If you, I mean, if you're looking clearly, and you're right, we are kind of a little off on off from woke capitalism specifically, but it's connected because woke capitalism can interfere with this process. If you look at the income tables that the U.S. Census maintains, and you adjust for inflation, um, I think everyone knows today, you know, why adjusting for inflation is so important. You see there, there have been periods where it's grown. There's been periods where it's gone down. It's slightly higher, um, or actually it's a bit higher um, than where it had been. So there has been some growth, certainly not enough growth. If you break down those periods, what you actually see is that depending upon the policy environment that existed at the time, you can create, um, in, in, you, you can dissect what was happening. And when you had policies that were supportive of entrepreneurship, like we were talking about earlier, that's when you saw the income gains go um, the most. And when you didn't see those, that's when you saw uh, incomes not keeping up with inflation. That's just what the data show. I, I guess my concern is that somebody like Jacob, when you graduate school, you can no longer afford to own your own home. You're not able to own your own. I, you know, I, if you, There's a gap between what you could do previous generations and what you can do today in terms of your overall ability, you know, your standard of living in your 20s, say, even if you're a college graduate. And so those types of things, it doesn't seem like if you're using capitalism, you're, you're trying to make arguments about everybody being better off. I mean, I'm not sure oh, that, oh, that, yeah, I'm not sure it's going to be a persuasive argument. You know, another thing I was thinking through in this sort of COVID context is you saw capitalism basically saying, marginalized person go back to work so you can boost an economy and your life doesn't matter. We heard all these narratives of deserving to die, right? Because you're you're not producing enough. Now I know you're looking at me weird. That's okay. I'm used to it. Um but you you we we kind of see sort of again I'm looking I look at language as of this a lot of what I do. 
So yeah, causing other problems. So I think this was just really interesting narrative surrounding that. And so I guess, you know, when I was listening to both of you talk and, and you know, maybe Amir and Jacob too can address this, but like going back to the, the, the woke part of that, does it matter woke for who? Because listening to kind of both the keynote presentations, so sorry, yeah, Danielle, I'll leave it there. Go ahead. <laughs> No, I, I, I like that you joined in because you're pushing the conversation in, a, in a, a direction that I appreciate. And it gets back to something that um, Jacob and Amir touched upon, which is this idea about, I mean, I think there's some real concern that these are uh, fake initiatives and they're, they're not really uh, well-intentioned by uh, corporations. I mean, I think it's hilarious who was an essential worker during COVID. That was fascinating. Um, but I happen to stand on the side of thinking, even if it's somewhat superficial, it's useful. And I know that's not a popular uh, position to have with this panel. And I'll tell you why. I'm a big believer in Timothy Snyder's uh, book on tyranny. And he talks about the importance of symbols. And even if you are adopting a symbol for a superficial reason, you are normalizing conversations and starting conversations around a topic. And so I am less judgy when it comes to why this, this organization has decided to put forth a certain sign or a certain flag or something like that. I am more, uh, I like that it is helping us have certain conversations. And so that's where I stand on that issue. I also think it opens the corporation up to criticism. And I actually think being called a hypocrite is a useful thing because <laughs> then we all, if we're called hypocrites, have to look in the mirror and decide if we need to make some changes. So I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing if a corporation does something in a symbolic way that doesn't seem authentic and then gets called out for it. And then they have to decide where they really stand on the issue and how to make a difference. So that's, I know that might not be a popular position, but that's where I stand on the issue uh, uh, of the, of sort of the, the symbolic gestures. Thank you, uh, Dr. Warren. You just highlighted the woke washing concept that you were speaking about earlier. And you know, a lot of community groups are, are some of those groups that are pushing back against these corporate entities that they're like, you're symbolic, you're just saying Black Lives Matter, but really you're doing nothing. And I'm just curious um, about that, the woke washing concept. I'm curious, you know, I mentioned $50 billion was pledged. Uh, very little of that was given for direct services to organizations in the community, which Dr. Zavataro was talking about. Um, I'm curious, how, how do, do you have any thoughts or ideas of, of getting that corporation going from that symbolic gesture to actually getting to that cash investment in the communities where the dollars actually get to the boots on the ground and that you can help transform some of these communities? Because, and, and do you think we can get to that point? Like, w will they pick a side? If they pick a side, is it going to be as harmful as Dr. Weingarten was saying? Well, so there's two parts to that. You threw in something at the end that I'm going to have to remember both of these. I'm not sure if, I'm gonna, <laughs> if I don't remember them both, let me know. Um, so in terms of seeing real change, I mentioned that shareholders are shareholder activists are pushing organizations to take a stand. And that's one of the best ways that we can do this because it's the owners themselves. And if you remember, Dr. Weingarten was very concerned about us stealing the property of the shareholders by doing all of these social initiatives. Well, if it's the shareholders themselves that are saying that they want these initiatives, that they want more engagement. And so right now I was reporting, I was talking about DEI reporting, but perhaps the next issue is, well, you've made contributions, but what's the quality of those contributions? contributions. Those are the types of things that shareholder activists can play a bigger role because they're the owners of the firm and it's their property and they can push the organization in particular uh, in a particular direction. To get to your second part, I did remember it. Uh, Dr. Weingarten's point, he says it's going to be detrimental, but yet I want to bring us back to something he said at the beginning because I thought it was fascinating. He started out by telling us that all of these initiatives, if they actually end up maximizing profit, aren't actually woke capitalism, they're just plain old capitalism. Mm -hmm. And there's no problem with that. Mm 
So it sounds like he doesn't have a problem with the activities themselves. He has a, a problem with calling them woke capitalism. So I think the solution is we just do all these activities. We take off the term woke, and that gets back to uh, <laughs> Dr. Zavar Taros. I'm sorry, I'm butchering your name. Point, <laughs> about, <laughs> a point about uh, um. The language is getting in the way because it sounds like we're, you know, Dr. Weingarten would be okay with some of these activities so long as they were done within the framework of profit maximization, which aligns with like Milton Friedman, the father of, you know, capitalism. I'm not sure that's the title, but uh, no, I would, would you just say, I think, and there's a huge distinction, and, and I think that that's really what's important and why perhaps the woke title is problematic, but to, you, to your point, one, if the shareholders voted for that, absolutely, but, and there's a really important but, Larry Fink, right, BlackRock, the, the passive funds, you actually, you and, and they're actually maybe even moving toward this direction. There's a possibility that BlackRock is going to, when they have shareholder resolutions, that they're going to actually take a poll of their investors prior to BlackRock voting. But right now, when BlackRock votes on shareholder resolutions, it is Larry Fink and his team that are the agents of all of these investors, and they don't know how those investors believe or, or would want to vote, uh, and, and they're voting on their own political preferences, not necessarily on the one concept that brings them all together, which is the financial returns. The, the, the other thing which I think is important is absolutely, look, there's lots of examples, Ben and Jerry's, right? They've done a fantastic job, not just creating a brand, but living a brand. And it's, they, they were, they've been bought out, right? They, they, they did very well uh, financially and was kind of consistent with those, uh, the, the world concept. That's absolutely, that's, that's the way it should be. As we get wealthier uh, as a society, we care about different issues. Right. And so that's naturally not necessarily everybody wants bigger cars or more cars. They may want the cars made differently. That's fine. Um, but when you get into this idea of a broader social responsibility, and that's where the woke isn't just a word. Right. It's creating a vague uh, kind of um, a, a vague mantra that you have to follow and that there is no specificity to it. It can be anything to anyone. It can become a distraction and, and, and in fact, harm uh, operations, harm profitability lead to other kind of consequences. But absolutely, you know, businesses are part of society and should reflect kind of our social values and the social values uh, change, businesses will change with it. That's just part of the process. So um, I have another question for you, Dr. Weingartner. So in the event that um, what is profitable isn't what is best for um, society as a whole, how does free market capitalism address that? So say um, minority communities need um, some sort of like change in uh, corporate behavior, but it's not profitable, right? and it's detrimental to these groups, how do you resolve that issue without some sort of governing body to force businesses to cooperate and operate in ways that are ethical and do treat um, consumers and members of the working class and um, people in poverty um, respectfully and um, allow them to uplift themselves? Well, the, 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 there's a number of, uh, of, of issues in there, but the, the, the simple question is, we're talking about the role of government and government institutions. So if the laws are not appropriate, we need to get the laws changed. Right? When you have an unjust law, the right thing to do is to change that unjust law. When you're talking about, um, and I'm sure it, it's not necessarily people of color as much as you're talking about low income people. And if you're talking about, is our income support system failing low income people? Absolutely. And there are in very important reforms that we need to make to our income support programs so that it becomes a basis for people to actually lift themselves up. And that is a, an important conversation, but it is a different conversation than how do we have these institutions that have an incredibly important role 
and in, in, in terms of uh, generating the wealth that has enabled us to have a standard of living, which is far superior in terms of being able to manage health, uh, being able to life expectancy, all of these basic human quality measures that are enabled by kind of a, a solid business community. Right? Farm, look at the COVID, we talked about COVID. Without a, a, a very vibrant pharmaceutical uh, community, we never would have been able to develop vaccines as quickly as we did. And we're all, and hopefully next year we can do this in person. And part of the reason is the treatments developed by Pfizer and the vaccines developed by Moderna and Pfizer, right? Th this is the private sector kind of performing its role. And so I think one of the issues when we talk about woke well, capitalism is society works best when different institutions play their proper role. And a lot of the things that I think Amir had talked about in his comments was what happens when the role of government is usurped to, to use that power in awful ways. And those are the things we need to stop. Those are the things that we need to prevent from happening because when each part of society plays its proper role, we end up with better outcomes. And undoubtedly, our income support program to me is one of the major things we need to address because it's not helping people who are low income, right, get past that generational poverty. That is a tragedy and that is something that we absolutely need to exist, but we should be yelling about this in Congress, not in corporate boardrooms. Uh, just as a quick follow-up question, I want to allow the other panelists to ask their questions. Um, so if you could just answer this briefly, but um, considering um, that in the end goal of this, um, giving people a uh, proper, proper health care and proper housing without reliance on necessarily working, um, isn't the end goal of that for businesses um, profitable to deny people uh, these basic rights? Uh, because if people are given these basic rights, they are able to unionize easier, they are able to strike easier without fear of um, following through on the poverty line. Um, I, I, I would say no, but even if it is, I would say it doesn't matter in that sense. Now, again, we're talking about what's good um, uh, policy. And so, you know, you, you need to set the right policy. Um, and so, you know, there's also a flip side argument, which is with a better social safety net, uh, you know, there could be less of an incentive to unionize because you have a more effective uh, social safety net. And so people are going to be pursuing other opportunities. You're talking about hypotheticals, which you know, there, there are many ways that, that could actually uh, kind of manifest itself quickly. Thank you, uh, Dr. Weingarten. Um, as you can tell, you know, you probably could tell what, what I support or don't support, but you were talking about the, the income gap, entrepreneurial spirit. Um, you know, I have the entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, you know, in some communities, entrepreneurial spirits are criminalized. And, and one example I'm thinking of is uh, Eric Garner, right? He was selling Lucy's, Lucy being a mm -hmm. loose cigarette, and he was killed for it. Ultimately, mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, the policy, you were just talking about policy. The policy at the time was that you cannot sell loose cigarettes, right? Which is why they even engaged him. And so those who made the policy, those with the power, and those that are put in power that make the policies are supported by the corporations that ultimately put them there and have the power to make those policies. My question is, what is, what is your solution um, to this type of issue? What is your solution? Do, do, the, do these companies either do this, like what Dr. Warren was saying, and don't call it anything and just do it? Because you were emphasizing the importance of the shareholders. You did mention the customer, the broader community, and those external stakeholders. But so whose interest is the most important? And is it okay if we just don't call it woke capitalism, like Dr. Warren said, and just do the activities? Is that something you could support or get behind? Well, there's <laughs> there's a lot there. Um, I don't think the corporations were involved with uh, making selling uh, Lucy's illegal. No, I'm uh, sorry. No, they're they're just so involved in so many other decisions that have been made that cause these systemic inequities that we currently are facing today. And and I was just associating that a policy ultimately made by somebody in power that was probably supported like somebody like Chuck Grassley, Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa. He's somebody that would support that kind of thing. Uh, a corporation helped keep him in power for the ancient time that he's been there. And so I'm curious, 
is it okay if corporations do these things behind the scenes without calling them anything, regardless of the shareholders, the stakeholders, or whoever? Who has the most priority in that group for you? The, the stakeholder, the shareholder, the community, the customer? Who, who should the corporation? And you're just saying, no, we, they shouldn't do it at all. Is that what you're saying? It, um, I, I am saying very, very, very simply, if it, the corporation is owned by the shareholders, right? So they have a responsibility, fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. In terms of laws, laws shouldn't be in place that criminalize uh, transactions between, especially adults, whether it's marijuana, right, or loose uh, cigarettes. That is a, a, a law that we need to to change. My view, because this is a consenting adults wanting to do a transaction that doesn't have harm on anyone outside of them. So that absolutely, there's no role of the government there. And I think we need to differentiate, or at least if we're looking forward, right? How do we get to a better place? Which I think is a really important question. To get to a better place, we need to change those laws in terms of the corporations position, right, in terms of what they should be doing, that is reflective of kind of one, their, your, your own, you're working in, in uh, responsible to your shareholders. But in doing that, you need to make sure your employees are representing your brand well, that it's going to be paying them uh, appropriately, that's going to be making sure they have the benefits, they have the work environment where they can represent your company correctly. When you're talking about customers, that's who you're serving. So you need to serve your customers well. To the extent, and this you see this in society, and this is why I, I mentioned that in my, in my product, my, my wife and I do this all the time. We buy cage-free eggs. You know, we, we, we are willing to sacrifice that income because we are animal lovers, right? And we don't like to see chickens um, treated awfully. We're willing to part with more money than necessary in order to purchase cage-free eggs. Now, that is something that uh, a company recognized. And now because of us as a, a customer, we you know, express that desire that exists. And now we can spend our money in that way. That's part of the process. That's to you. To what uh, Dr. Warren was saying, that's to me not wealth, that's part of the process. But when you start giving disinterested third parties, and I think that is the most important part of what we're talking about, what's wrong with woke capitalism, and you can call it whatever you want, you start giving disinterested parties outside of the company, they're not customers, they're not employees, they're not shareholders, giving them rights and, and say over what the company does, right? And that is what my understanding, my belief of what woke capitalism is attempting to do, that's where you actually have a problem. That's why companies should say no. It is in, in, in business to provide income to the owners by serving the customers well. That's the social role of a company. Now, there's lots of, so, there's lots of social issues that need to be dealt with, and we need to deal with these. They're very, very important. I'm not trying to minimize any of these really important social issues. I'm saying we deal with them best by dealing in the government or in, uh, we as consumers expressing our view, our desires. I won't buy anything by a company that's still in Russia. Why? Because I think what they've done is horrific and we should, you know, we should not be supporting that. They should be pulled out. That's my choice as a consumer. And all of us can express that. That's part of the process. But we don't have a say over the company if, you, if you're outside of, the, of that ecosystem. Thank you, Wayne. Do you support the companies that kill my people that are some of the same companies? Do you, do you have that same standard when, when right here in our own backyard, people are, are, are dying from fentanyl use, people are getting killed by police, people are killing people. Do you support, do you support the companies that support that? Of course they're not. I mean, absolutely not. Okay, thank you. I just want to be clear on that. Yeah. Um, to ask a question to Dr. Warren, um, when you were discussing um, how, like, no matter if it's just like face value um, support or, um, you know, it's like small, but still ultimately like helpful um, changes because of woke capitalism in businesses, um, do you think that there are any concerns to be had with? businesses kind of trivializing the social movements. Uh, for example, um, every year in June, uh, you know, it's Pride Month. And before 
Pride Month was largely um, a gathering of um, members of the LGBTQ plus community to um, kind of express some of the injustices that they faced. And since then, when a lot of people think of Pride Month, they simply think of it as the month where every corporation changes their logo to um, have a rainbow banner or to sell um, and profit off of Pride merchandise and not really espouse a lot of the messaging that um, is supposed to come from Pride Month and in a lot of ways kind of uh, muddies it. So what do you propose be the alternative? Um, I suppose uh, I would propose the alternative to be um, corporations actually, um, or corporations simply upholding standards in the workplace of not discriminating between um, these people. And if there are, um, you know, if people ask for like sponsoring or donations or anything like that, like specifically from the movements um, themselves, then um, I suppose, you know, that would be okay. So my answer to you would be by them initiating an interest in a particular cause, you can start the conversation for what you're talking about. Um, so I actually see them as, you, know, you see it as them trivial, trivializing this important topic. And I see them as entering a conversation and opening the door for some real influence. So I guess it's a matter of perspective and it's probably an empirical question, but one that I don't know the evidence for and I myself have not studied, but it's an, it's an interesting question. From my perspective, I think having firms express their position on a social issue, uh, just like what we were talking about earlier with Black Lives Matter, they say that they care about this. Well, this is opening the door for conversations about, well, what are you actually doing if this is what you care about? I think inaction is probably scarier. So, you know, for all the people that yellow corporations, you're saying too much about this. You have to think about whether or not you want the alternative, which is that they say nothing. And they say nothing, but they are still part of political life through political donations. So it's not like they're not part of political life, they're just part of it in a way that is less transparent. So, you know, I favor the expression of positions, even ones that I don't agree with, because I'd like to hear what you have to say about this and then be part of the conversation. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Great. Well, I think we may have ourselves a bit of a stopping point here because it is time for audience Q&A. So I'm going to uh, ask my uh, colleague and co-chair Caleb to uh, maybe read out one of the questions from our uh, vast studio viewing audience and uh, see how our keynotes and our panelists respond. So Caleb, do you have anything you'd like to share with uh, our panel and uh, keynotes right now? Uh, yeah, so one question about uh, about Russia. So um, does uh, the opposition to woke capitalism uh, suggest that you know companies shouldn't respond to to the situation in Ukraine? I mean, that's um, absolutely not. I mean, that's again a um, a, a decision that uh, companies are making in, in 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 large part because customers are demanding it. and so that's absolutely they should. So we have another question. It, it, it uh, basically asks, you know, how can companies uh, that, that, are, that are kind of focused on profit maximization uh, adapt to this new situation where we have so many consumers who are concerned about, you know, uh, ethical consumption? You need to please them. I mean, that's where, uh, that's where there's, an alignment so much so that I thought that Dr. Weingarten was suggesting that, you know, if, if, if it's profit maximizing and it is pleasing, you know, it's serving some uh, social good, then it's like the perfect situation. So 
And, and that was the position of going back to, I know someone has said in the chat that uh, Friedman was not the father of capitalism. I know it was Adam Smith, but in 1970, Milton Friedman wrote his article about the profit of the, the social responsibility of businesses to increase its profits. But if you look at his argument, he's very much in favor of um, CSR if it benefits the bottom line. I mean, you can see that in his, he was aligned with John Mackey, the founder of Whole Foods in the Reason article. You can see them debating back and forth in, I think it was 2006. And Mackey, it, you know, John Mackey, the, the entrepreneur who started Whole Foods has a very specific position on social issues <laughs> and on food. And Milton Friedman, you can see it in his own words. He says, I'm perfectly fine. Mackie, you are perfectly aligned with my philosophy regarding business. So there was an earlier question about, um, about Citizens United that, that was mentioned, but I, but I wanna uh, focus on, on again. Um, I mean, basically I think the question was about, you know, how can, how can you oppose, uh, you know, corporate involvement in politics? Um, you know, in the wake of Citizens United, and I guess all the lobbying and, and, and things like that, corporate uh, money is speech, basically, you know, in, in a sense of uh, how can you be opposed to woke capitalism, um, but not also oppose, you know, Citizens United or, you know, corporate speech, you know, financial contributions being speech, you know, isn't there a kind of tension or contradiction there? You know, I don't think there's a, there's a contradiction. I mean, to, to the extent that you have um, government policy that's going to be influencing uh, you know, the impact of a corporation, it, it, they, they would and have every right and should be able to to, you know, beseech Congress in the same way that uh, no individual or no union or no, you know, um, charitable organization would not you know, interact with people on D.C. if a policy is being debated or proposed that would, uh, impl you know, impact them. I mean, and that's, uh, you know, there's something completely anti-democratic to say, you know, we're going to do something that's going to impact you and you're not allowed to, you know, have a conversation, influence, show us your, um, you know, opinion or, or why you think we're wrong. I mean, I think that would be, uh, you know, absolutely, uh, you know, the exact opposite of what we're talking about. When we're talking about democracy and freedom. And yeah, Neil, anything you want to add there? I, I think it's hard to be in support of one and not the other. Okay, so um, before Caleb, you ask the next question. I want to quickly, quickly thank the audience for submitting all your Q and A items. We have a bunch of them here that uh, we're going through. Caleb is our gatekeeper. So Caleb, what's the next question up that uh, you want to go over? Yeah, so with just with the, you know, the escalating homelessness and the income inequality and just the social issues that we have, you know, what are the sort of policies that, that government and, and I think corporations as well could support that would actually address these uh, yes, while so also being compatible with their, you know, their, their long-term productivity? Amir, Stacy, Jacob, any uh, follow-up that you may have on that? I, I definitely, um, so I feel like uh, first and foremost, investment in the community, in the most impacted, harmed, disadvantaged, whatever you wanna call it. Because Dr. Weingarten earlier said, you know, he said people of color, but then he said income, right? That's the, that's the bigger correlate there. And it just so happens there's almost a one-to-one -one relationship with your demographic and your income, unfortunately. Um, due to many reasons. So in direct investment in the community, if you want to pledge money to help an issue, a social issue, because I feel like corporations are part of the social problem. So I also feel like this should be part of the social solution in some areas. So if you directly invest in the community, into these community-based organizations in the forms of grants, uh, you know, just uh, grants and other opportunities for funding through private foundations, so on and so forth, and get them into the hands of the people that know how to fix their own problems, right? Like it's always a top-down approach. The, the government or somebody else is always telling this community, hey, this is how you can solve your problem. No, as a matter of fact, we can solve our own problem. We just are lacking the resources. And in some cases, the skills or abilities and training to do certain things, but we can pay for that when we have the resources. So I think a more direct investment back into the community, reduce the footprint, uh, of government in the sense of having them do everything, right? We want their resources and their funding, reduce the footprint, improve, and then reinvest back into the community. That, that's the framework that I, that I like to use. 
um, when, when I'm thinking about community-based solutions, that, that's my approach on that. And I think um, like what Amir is touching on is this, this concept, and again, I, I'm, I'm with you, Danielle, like my internet's going in and out. So like if I drop off again, I'm so sorry. But like um, what Amir is touching on is like what we in my you know public admin lane, it's just this notion of a wicked problem. So I'm struggling listening to some of the context of government has to stay out of business and business has to stay out of government when there is just literally no way to uncouple those because then you get you get what Amir is describing of, okay, homelessness, I'm here in Orlando, <clears throat> huge problem. Okay, let's build affordable housing. Oh, 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 it's the words. It goes back to what Danielle was saying in her presentation too, like the words and the language and how you're framed matters. And that's kind of what she was pointing out with Wayne. If you take the word woke away, all of a sudden it's fine. So if you take away these, uh, uh, you, you, you said that the capitalist notions of some of that could be fine if these words are taken away. So you get these sort of wicked problems and people want to come together for solutions, but sometimes you see, you see nimbyism or, you know, sometimes you see, you know, yes in my backyard. So it's, where's that line? So I'm, I struggle with the same thing I think everyone has said is, you know, how do you find solutions? I mean, let's kind of be real underlying for me what some of Amir is saying, and this was getting at my question after like woke for who, if we put the word woke, do we not like it because that means black? And if we say it's just good, it's capitalism and it means white, that's kind of a question that I'm struggling, you know, with listening to and how these things are really just framed, not just here, but framed, <laughs> framed, you know, big and, and broad. So I'll stop there. Wayne, some uh, follow up on that since uh, you had some uh, facial remarks that uh, you may want to make. <laughs> Well, just the, the the facial remark was just uh, in the the differentiation. I, I I know what Dr. Zavato was saying there, and and there is overlap, right? If we have our little concentric circles, there is overlap. I, I think what's really important though is understanding kind of how uh, ownership structure works. I think that's the the part that we just can't undermine. That if to the extent you're talking about woke capitalism means stakeholder responsibility, and I think that's where my, my, my facial expression came from is that uh, I, I wouldn't want that part to be uh, kind of lost. I guess that would be, you know, in, in, in terms of um, what, what, what Amir was saying, I, I would also uh, add that one thing that uh, could be done, I think would be very helpful, is when you look at occupational licensing laws. I mean, that in some jurisdictions, you need six months to a year's worth of training to be a hairstylist. Uh, and you need to take classes and spend a, a tremendous amount of money. It, it's just you don't have the time or the liquidity around to do that. So if we could loosen up those laws to part of an empowerment where if, if someone's very good at hairstyling, why do they need 12 months of classes to do something that they already have the talents for? And I think those types of reforms could actually uh, work with some of the things that Amir was saying and be very impactful in terms of helping uh, you know some of those communities kind of gain income and, 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 and be better off. Okay. Yeah, if I could say something about the power of language, because I think it's really interesting um, Getting back to what Stacey was just saying, you know, why are no firms that are leaving Russia being referred to as woke or woke washing? I mean, I think that there's some associations that are going on. And I'm also I'm thinking back to I looked at the types of corporate social initiatives that firms adopted for both Black Lives Matter and COVID and which ones get referred to as woke or woke washing and which ones are just sort of they're fine. And so there might be some labeling going on that has some, you know, racial <laughs> undertones, overtones, whatever you want to refer to it as. Uh, there's there's some uh, laden uh, issues attached to the language of woke, and that's something that we possibly need to be addressing. So um, another good question: uh, reducing carbon emissions, you know, is is likely not to be profitable and. Uh, so isn't it kind of unrealistic to think that, you know, the political process will solve this? Isn't there some role for, for corporations here to, to solve this kind of problem? Well, I, I think one, it's very important to recognize that emissions in the U.S. peaked uh, in about 2007 and now about 15 percent lower 
than where they were. So we've actually been reducing our emissions in the U.S. And the reason we've been reducing our emissions is actually because of the fracking revolution. The fracking revolution brought natural gas prices down, uh, made it uh, more competitive than coal. And you, know, you can even look at the Energy Information Administration where they talk about why our emissions is declining. It's consistently because of natural gas. Uh, because when you replace coal with natural gas, you get fewer emissions. Uh, and that's what we've seen. And so actually the U.S. has been a leader in reducing emissions. And that reduction is based off of the fracking revolution, which has been kind of driven by uh, private sector. And so that's the, the model that I think is very important in terms of uh, incenting that innovation. One of the uh, topics I've worked on is what, something we call clean tax cuts, which is basically um, allowing uh, marginal tax rate reductions or preferences for uh, companies that come up with zero or low emission uh, resources. So as a ways to basically, as opposed to having a penalty on, on companies for emitting, you give an incentive, a carrot, instead of the stick, use a carrot to uh, reduce emissions further. So there's all sorts of uh, you know innovations that we can incent, and it's through innovation that we're actually going to continue to see our, our, our emissions come down and, and address the, uh, the issue of, uh, of global climate change. And that, that's some real stuff, Dr. Weingarten, because, you know, at one point in my life, I was picking up cigarette butts for 35 cents an hour in a prison. And what came to my mind was capitalism and, uh, you know, the, the hidden capitalism, right? The warehouse labor, the things that happen behind scenes that nobody talks about that I feel like we should be woke to, as we say, woke, woke, woke. Um, I, I kind of like the word. I'm probably going to say it a lot for the rest of the day because it's now it's in my head. But um, I, I just want to say um, we need to bring attention to that as well, because that 35 cent an hour didn't set me up for success upon reentry into society. It didn't reduce incidences of violence in the facility. It didn't teach me or do anything other than I was like, I'm being exploited in a different way than my ancestors were when they were forcibly enslaved. I made some bad decisions and now I'm, I'm, I'm penalized in this way. So, so it's just very interesting. And I really appreciate everyone's perspective. I just want to say I learned a lot. I, mean, I appreciate everyone's respect and courtesy and insight on this. I appreciate all the questions. We're now going to do the audience poll. So I would like to ask my assistant behind the scenes to uh, put that poll question up. Audience, how do you want to vote? What side of the dilemma are you leaning towards? Should businesses jump in or are you voting the opposite? Should businesses stay out? So there we have it. So you, the people, our fine audience, have come up with your conclusion. And that is going to kind of put the finishing touches on this wonderful ethics and responsible business forum. So with that, on behalf of the organizing committee, and all our guest speakers, we want to thank you, our audience, for listening and participating. This does not happen without you.